Oh, you're the coordinator. The coordinator of the nine out of ten. It's not bad. Well, now we have to add. We have to add the results, and uh, the maximum will be 300, and uh, we will see the final result. Okay, here we go. Now we have to see the results and the final mark. Did you sum? No, you have to sum this. You have to add. To add all the results and see the final score of your school. This is not bad. Uh, it is so-so, uh, let's say. Okay, so... Let's see. If you have from 240 to 300, could be... 
you are the best. I mean, you... That's a good school. Not you, but your school is really good. I mean, if you do the things that we mentioned here, that is good. If you come from 150 to 20 or 240, then you have to keep on working and maybe change some of the things that we read there. But if you have less than 150 that I saw some, you need a school revolution, a school revolution or whatever. I mean, you need to change these things. I mean, maybe you cannot do that by yourself, but you can help to change this. How? Offering yourself to be the head teacher or, or coordinating anything or, I mean, we have, to, we have to do these things. We cannot be happy with what we have. We have to try to change these things. Why? Because we have here. Number two, we work effectively in partnership with parents, professionals, and other teachers. Do you work with parents? Yes, they can. With professionals from, could be, and other teachers. Well, we try to find schools in England, but we have schools in our same village. And we can do exchanges of experiences. We can do the presentations of the projects and tasks with these other kids in other schools. Okay? And then our, our kids, especially those who need this extra support, are going to feel that they're doing something absolutely amazing for them, which is only and as simple as to go to another school, prepare a visit to this other school, and do the same presentation that they did here in this other school. That's, for them, the top. I mean, they've been to this school. We've been there, it was the meeting room there, full of people, and they liked what we did. So that's good. Or, the staff are confident and appropriately trained when working with bilingual learners. For example, here, we need two types of training. Now, which training do you get? Do you get from the FEP? We were talking about that now. And what about the quality of the training that you have? Now, I'm working on a thesis with and uh, we're working on that, on the training that they get. And uh, we have to see the results. Sometimes that's the training that they have to get is, is free, but it's not the proper training, because we need training on CLIL. Tell me the training on CLIL that you have found in which they told you exactly how to teach social science in English. Tell me, tell me if any of you have got any training on how to teach your subject social science, nature, physical education, in a bilingual context, in CLIL. Any? See it. So this is something we have to change. This is something we need. We need to see that people don't get the proper training. And if I don't know how to teach that, I will be doing the same teaching that I did back in the 90s, or at the beginning of this uh, century, or what our Ancestors did in mid uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, some 50 years ago. It's going to be, we're going to use the traditional teaching. And now in English, so it's going to be hard. For people with only a B2 level, teach contents, use all the strategies in a foreign language. So maybe the training courses that we need is this, is to tell people how to work with this subject in this specific context. That's going to be good. And we have to change that. Lessons provide appropriate cognitive challenge to bilingual learners, especially those with difficulties. Or the pace of lessons is always adapted to make good progress in their learning. I think that if we could come and see the final result, and the result comes to near 300, that's good. But if it is not even 150, we have to change some things, okay? Any of the things that we mentioned here, for example, the Coordinator of the bilingual program oversees the CLIL teaching procedures and offers advice. You, you are the coordinator. Again, then you as the coordinator have to have the tools because you want to feel sure, secure, confident when you come to school and say, I'm the coordinator and I have the tools. I have to, the options to tell you on what to do with these special situations in your lessons. So you have to be properly trained to help the others. And that's something, again, that we have to uh, try to get. Okay, and then, again, it is, this is also in the first slide, we have to keep on thinking and learning and working and learning and then acting and fighting to change things. If not, no one will come and change this thing for us. Okay, there are many challenges that teachers face and that we all face 
and that you will face in the classroom. For example, the class size. The class size is one of those things that we want to change. But if we had 20, we would say the same. That's for sure. If we had 22 or 27. So maybe what we have to do is to get some help if we can, or see how to manage the classroom, how to change the organization of the classroom, how to cope with diversity in these different settings. For example, these of groupings that you saw uh, the first day with Elena and the cooperative work. It takes teachers time and energy and frustration that we saw, the lack of materials and resources that we have. And if I ask you, do we have a lack of materials? No, we have plenty of materials. The thing is that sometimes we are overloaded of materials. And we have such a big amount of materials that we don't know where to start with. And from which is the, the proper materials that we have to use. So the best thing is to organize and say, okay, these are good for these things, these are good for those things, and keep a good a library of those uh, materials that you're going to use. Not everything is good. In the internet, you find terrible things and beautiful things. So you have to know very well what to, what to select. The lack of knowledge of differentiation uh, sometimes. The cooperation with other school staff members, it is not always easy. It is not always easy. It is something that we say as if schools were the paradise, and then you come and working with others is not always a very easy thing. The lack of knowledge of the different methods to apply. When, if I ask you for a method that you apply, you say clear. And if I ask you what clearly is, you say teach in English through contents or contents through English. But if I ask you how do you do that, then we will start not having answers for that. And then if we come to the special situations that we can face, it is even worse. So the people who need more support have less options. And we have to try to request proper training on the side of SEPs. And if we have this training, say this is the proper training we need. And when we do the report at the end of the training, say that this was not good that this was not what we expected, that this cannot be applied. That it's not a matter of PowerPoint, it is a matter of saying clearly what to do in the classroom with this special or with these kids in a normal setting, in a, a mainstream school. The lack of knowledge of different methods, as I said, the lack of confidence in the use of the foreign language, and this is very important. Remember, and you have to remember always, that you don't need a C2 level to teach in primary education. You need to feel confident using the English that you need. And that's it. That's it. We were talking about the importance of the visual effect, the visual help, talking on specific things of physical education. Bounce the ball. Bounce, you have to bounce the ball. You have to bounce the ball. Now we know what bounce the ball is, but we can't tell them. You have to head the ball. You have to head the ball. Okay, you head the ball. And then they know what head the ball is. So it is only a matter of that. It is that I need this. The parts of the body, you have to be the best of all. When you teach parts of the body, the parts of the flower, the, anything that you're going to teach, but you have to be the best in that section. Forget about, well, let's pretend we are at the airport in Munich and we have to, we're not going to use that. We have to know specific vocabulary for these things. No, I need this for my training, this for my lessons, and I want to start every single day with these sentences that I'm going to practice a lot with them. I want to say goodbye to them with these others that they're going to use. I want to practice in this term, these uh, sentences, these idioms, these, uh, and I'm going to use that every single day to make them learn that because of the use, not because of what they are going to learn in a list of words that they will forget. And then I'm happy with that English. Someone is coming from the university to visit us and he's uh, from England. Happy, okay. I will talk about anything. That's the nature teacher in his know everything about biology? Are they supposed to know the whole thing? So that's what you have to do. Start being confident with the use of English that you have. And not enough time with the language assistant, which is, I don't know in all the communities, but in Andalusia we had, we used to have, a, I'm going to pass this. You know what jigsaw is? Yeah? Do you practice jigsaw? Who practices jigsaw? No? Do you know what that is? No? Okay. This is really good to, again, make these kids participate and make them feel that they can do things for the rest of the group. It is very simple. Let's see if we can play that.
Okay, I mean, what she's doing now, you will see that. See, we're going to make experts. But experts on only one thing. So I'm going to be expert on this particular thing. And then I will again spread the news. I will go to my team and I will tell them what I learned. And the others will tell them, will tell me right, what they learned. So we're going to learn, that's going to be in a cooperative way. Well, this is something that we can do in any subject. And the good thing of this is that any kid is going to be responsible of spreading what he or she learned. Not, cannot be done if we don't give them the tools. Because they will learn things, but they have to know how to say this orally to the rest. So make sure that you give them the tools to be able to say these things in English. For that, it is good that you work cooperatively always with a teacher of English. He or she will know very well what to do to make them produce orally. Then it's going to be easy for you to work with them because those things can be learned in the English lessons. Instead of learning stupid things that they will never use, they can learn in the English lessons what they're going to put into practice in your lessons. Well, and then before, and now we're going to change and almost finish, we, we were talking about these kids who have no information at home. Then they go home, parents cannot help them, and they feel that, uh, well, they cannot do what they're supposed to do. Because they don't understand, because they didn't get the idea, because they forgot about the task, because they don't know exactly what they're supposed to do in that task, or the role that they have to assume. And for that I proposed some years ago to my students the creation of a blog and then, for example, for the opposiciones, for the competitive exams, they always have a, they, they prepare uh, their own blog. And in that blog, they have to upload information. Why? Not for passing the opposiciones. It is for parents, for example. It is for the kids. And for parents, I need them, I want them with a mobile phone to come to the blog. This blog is only for this class. And there they have the proper explanation of the task. Or information that is going to link their learning of their kids with the families, which is not easy very uh, many times. And now, when I don't understand anything, what do I do? I go to a private academy and they have to explain these things for me, or maybe the teacher could do something that I called the, here we go, teacher open online courses. It is you doing what people do in a massive So see how we're going to give them. In each unit, for example, here it's the explanation of the grammar thing in Spanish. Why in Spanish? In, in English, because they need that in Spanish. If you do the whole thing again in English, they will get lost. So maybe this, for these kids, could be in Spanish. Number two, if you do that, and it takes you only three minutes per unit, you will have at the end a bank of resources for next year, for the other year, and for the coming years, and that's going to be you there doing exactly the same as you did in the classroom. With the camera, you, and saying the parts of the tree, the parts of the earth, or movements in physical education. You do that, you record yourself for three minutes, and then you upload that to the blog, which is absolutely easy. And then they will have their resource at home, not only parents, but also the kids. And they will not have the excuse 
of saying, I don't know how to do that. I couldn't get, or I didn't come that way. You will have that. A short summary of what you explained, not daily, not daily, you cannot do that, of course, but for each of the units. We're talking about six, nine units? Six, nine videos like this? Maybe for the tasks. Tasks are complex. When you explain how to do a game, even in Spanish, people do not get the idea or how to play the, the game. So it is even worse if you do that in English. So why don't you do that to explain the task? And maybe families get involved and they prepare customs or they help them buy materials or getting anything that they could bring to school. It is only a matter of three minutes, two minutes, nine units, 18 minutes of your life are going to make your life much easier doing these simple things. And a blog, Blockster, you go to Blockster, you can prepare your blog in five minutes. You don't need to be an ICT uh, freaky, you can be a normal person who comes to school, who teaches, who do other things, but prepare these things. And this, believe me, really works. It really works with all the kids, especially with those who need this extra support. Well, and just to finish, the last tips, I mean, if I were you, of course, I would frequently assess the strengths, talents, and interests of my learners through questionnaires, dialogues, or interest surveys. Why? Because I need to know, I need to know who I'm talking to. When I come here this morning, I don't know what I'm going to face. The only thing I know is that I have people who are interested. That's it. It's different from a university class. It is more or less the same as the, the competitive exams. Because you have people who want to learn, who are here, left home, going to spend here one week because they want to learn something. But when you come to school, you have to know very well the expectations of these kids. And they have their own expectations. You can do these things. They're simply talking to them or getting these questionnaires, quick things, that if you prepare once, you can use many times. Remember that. It is not a waste of time. It is uh, the preparation of what is going to come next. Or, for example, I will rotate the teaching of content through different learning styles. As I told you, we have different learning styles. And maybe some of you are more visual. Some others prefer movement and more kinesthetic. And some others prefer the traditional and memory thing. And well, so what I have to do is to, not to say, no, no, I love visual vision. I mean, you can love whatever, but you have to love what they really care. And they care learning. And they want to feel that when they leave the classroom, they know what you learned, what you taught. So. Or where I'm a classroom environment, enough so there is a balance of structure and freedom, business, business, not business, business and quiet, group work and independence. And finally, I would provide enough multiple intelligence-based choice opportunities so my students could choose to learn and show what they know in the ways they prefer. I want them to come here and do what they have to do. I mean, I want them to come here and only in five minutes with the rest of the group, tell us the final product of their task or say how this works after being preparing this for the whole term. Or saying, presenting the website of our school in Jaén and how we're going to sell the olive oil from Andujar anywhere in the world. And then they will prepare, they will talk, they will make a questionnaire, they will talk to people in a very easy thing, in a very easy way. You can do that in both Spanish and English. Remember that you are in bilingual schools, not monolingual schools in English. Bilingual schools, okay? And I would build the culture of my classroom in which students are encouraged to persist, resolve conflicts positively, and be entrepreneurial, to work on the entrepreneurship. This is basic, this is clear. And finally, stretch beyond my own teaching and, sorry, my own teaching, style comfort zone, and teach beyond the way I remember being taught. That's one of our failures. I mean, maybe we have to think that when someone came and taught us like that, we didn't like that very much. So maybe we have to change and try to uh, remove and leave this comfort zone, okay? And uh, I run out of time. There are some other people who have the presentation. So you can see these other uh, tips that I prepared for you. And uh, but we don't have time. Do we, Elena? No? And uh, just the last thing. I, this is like two, yeah, no, no, only two minutes, okay? Uh, two minutes and I'm finished. Uh, let me check your expertise. I mean, let me see, I mean, because you're good and you're here and all the th beautiful things that I told you today. 
But now we have this case study of this possible situation that you may face. Let's see how to do. We, know, we don't have the time to work on the first one. We're going to move to the second one. We have this girl who interrupts or intuits the teacher and other students, has difficulty waiting for her turn, is very forgetful, and doesn't pay attention to details. A girl who rarely finishes tasks and assignments, has a short-term memory, and a messy desk. It doesn't matter the subject. What do you do with her? What do you do? You can't. You have to give solutions. And you have to know how to work with this girl. Are you prepared to, to what? Are you prepared to follow the recommendations that I have to do? Or are you prepared to do what you can? What comes first to your mind? Maybe you do this today and you change your mind to the, tomorrow because of the uh, context, because of the time you have, because of the work that you have to do with the rest of the group. So that is difficult. So my recommendations here would be, for example, I would sit here in a place with little distraction. So you have to know that with this kind of students, with this deficit, deficit disorder, you need to sit them in a place where they cannot get distracted. Number one. Number two, I would state behavior that you want and expect. How? These are the classroom rules. This is not stupid. This is not something that, well, the, I mean, we have to create our own classroom rules so that their pay mates are going to tell her that she has to follow the rules. Maybe she has given some of the rules, and so she has to follow them. Or use the body system that we mentioned here before. You know what the body system is? I mean, you do that. You know that, but maybe you don't know the name. The body system is that I'm going to place someone who is going to help her, okay? Someone who is a bit stronger or a more advanced learner, and she or he is going to help her, or is going to talk to her, is going to make her work, is going to tell her not to disrupt her work. Next. I would develop a sense of humor. Necessary. Always. We don't need malafoyas in our classes. Never, ever. Never. You don't recall that. But we don't need that. I mean, develop that sense of humor. Make a relaxing atmosphere in the classroom. But we don't need that of being very strict with someone who is not going to follow the rules if you follow that way. Or I would vary voice, the tune and the inflection. That's very important for these kids. That's very important because they lose the attention. And then you have to bring that attention. How? Changing the tone of what you're going to say. Okay? You don't have to be fighting. You only have to change the tone and they will again look at you and listen to you again. Remember that for this case, for example, you tell them, go to the end of the class and bring me this. And then the best thing is to ask them, okay, tell me what are you going to do? And then they will tell you if they remember that, that they have to go there and do this. So if you give them an assignment, especially in English, Tell them to repeat what they are expected to, to do. Or I would, of course, expect the unexpected, as we mentioned here also in this uh, course. Use physical proximity and touch. Make sure you uh, teach the sound system of the target language specifically. And um, have her repeat the instructions. Move around the classroom and use mnemonics to help uh, repetition and memory. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and uh...